hello and welcome to Box to Box, the football talk show brought to you by Sportology TV with myself, Ali Drew, and my co-host, Uni. On the last episode, we were joined by Sky Sports' JD Dyer, who was talking to us about the big debate that's going on at the moment. Who is better, Mbappe or Haaland? And we spoke to him about how he got into the industry and just his thoughts on the season so far, but on this episode. Guys, this time around, we bring to you another former football player, somebody who's played over 200 games for Aston Villa, uh, a club legend, uh, somebody who's been in the England setup, played for the under 21s and the senior team. He's gone on to show his face on TV, does bits of punditry for Sky Sports, and talks a lot of sense talking football. That we're talking about none other than Lee Hendry. Lee, how you doing, mate? You all right? I'm very good. I don't know about talking sense, so I'm not sure about <laughs> that one. <laughs> No, no, you, you, I watched you a few times, man. I've learned quite a few things, to be honest. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. How, how are you finding that? How's life been after after sort of football and going into this sort of, this sort of thing? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a, it was always going to be a struggle coming out of, of, of playing football, really, to be honest. I, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, you, when, you, when you're in the change room and you're with a, a lot of older, experienced players, uh, which I was with, you know, likes of Steve Staunton, Andy Townsend, as I was as a kid growing up, they'd always say, you know, sort of plan for your future. You know, career don't last forever, and you, you don't think of that as a as a player at that time and a young player. Uh, you just think that it's just going to continue on, and you're going to enjoy playing football, earn good money, and all the rest of it. And it's it it's a it is a difficult transition coming out of the game um, and trying to find your feet really, because I feel that you know not all players want to go into coaching you know some not all players want to go into media really uh, but I think it's it's trying to find a, a, a gap where you can fill that space of you know doing the, your day-to-day routines where you're getting up going training um, mixing with the lads having a bit of banter in the changing rooms whereas you're not having to do that and it, I, f- I find I find that really difficult at, at the start um, obviously try to do a bit of coaching uh, see if I could sort of find that niche and whether I wanted to do that, which I enjoyed it to a certain extent. But, you know, I just felt that the coaching side of it wasn't for me. I, you know, I thought I was going to have a go. I was half having a go at the media side at the, at the similar sort of time. So I just started finding my feet in the media world and I'm slowly getting there and, and, and picking little bits off that I want to get involved in. Really. So it's been it's been tough, but I think it's took me. I've got to say about six, six, seven years to really find out where I actually go, want to go and, and, and what sort of route I'm on, really. So it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult period. Lee, how much, how much support do you get or how many people do you have sort of backing you, pushing you towards direction, certain directions after football? Because unless you're, a, um, for example, a Rio Ferdinand or someone who's played uh, at, the, at the top and won many titles and known around world football, if you're not, I would imagine this is a bit more of a struggle. How was it? How was that for yourself? Was it quite a lot of support? Was there anything like that going on after football? Yeah, I, I mean, you're dead right. I mean, it's 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 one of them situations. You know, if, if you you've got that clout that you come with as a as a footballer and you won trophies and Premier Leagues and stuff like that, it makes things a lot easier and it gives you a little bit more guidance. But you know, if you haven't, you know, you, there isn't much out there that that gives you that. It, it's it's literally down to yourself whether you're going to go and take the ball by its horns and 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 try and you know find your find your way in into to whatever world you want to go into but I do find it that's one thing that really disappoints me frustrates me at times is that you know I speak to uh, players that have just finished now and and they've just they've still got no guidance and it's it's pretty much like how I was you know probably what 10 10 years ago where I come out of the game is that there was there was just nothing, you know, you get the odd phone call off someone and then it sort of filter out into nothing really. So I do feel that there's, that area has got to be strengthened because, you know, some of these guys are coming out of the game earning big money. Um, some people haven't invested well, some people have, um, but you still need to, whether it's money or not, you know, you still need to find that, that niche of, it's jumping out of a, a world where you've just been in a routine for so long when you're not in that that's where the boredom hits in and you end up, people end up doing things, you know, they, I mean, gambling and stuff like that. And it's, I just feel that there's not enough support um, in the football, in the football world for that at all. Yeah. Cause you recently appeared on Harry's Heroes. Um, you with, with Harry Redknapp and you, I think you spoke to Vinnie Jones and Paul Merson about just some of the struggles that you've had since you retired and that 
people probably don't realize they just see professional footballers are oh, successful they retire they've got all this money they can just do a, you know live a free life but it's not how it actually seems yeah it, it, i mean it, it is and that and, and that's that's where i mean certain people i i speak to people um quite quite a lot actually it's it's, it's strange since i actually came out and spoke quite freely about stuff um you know i've had a lot of contacts from ex players players i've played with that they found it really hard and really, you know, a, a struggling life coming out of football. And, um, you know, speaking to Vinny and, and and Paul Merson, who have been for their own problems, different to what I have, it's, you know, you can see why uh, that, 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 that these players and, and some people don't really want to go in. They go into a shell and they don't want to talk about it. But I find it works better for me to, to actually come out and, and say, you know, there's not enough support. We, You know, we, we're coming out of a world where, we're almost well almost like pop stars if you get what I mean we earn good money we've got nice houses you know we're in the limelight and when you come out of that it's it's it's, it's so difficult um and and I found it really hard it, it just because I just had no direction in where I wanted to go um and I, I had my own struggles with, with depression which was was I mean you know I still struggle with that now but it's it, it's having that niche where you can speak to people and people can relate relate to what you you are going through and I can assure you now that probably 60 70 percent of footballers who come out of the game whether they're you know they've invested or not or in, in and and got you know plenty of money to, to sort of survive on or you know they'll certainly will struggle in some certain extent one of my good mates has just finished and he, he just doesn't know what to do and he's getting to that stage now where the boredom's set in Obviously, the, the current situation has been hard enough as it is, and it, it, it's just—I just feel that there needs to be a lot more that that that, that, that the in help situations um, to help people get through these these tough times because it's it's a big it's a big turnover. It really is. Lee, I was I was watching uh, Rio Ferdinand's channel, and he was talking to uh, Saido Berahino. Uh, so he used to play for um, West Brom, moved to Stoke, and now he's in Belgium. And he spoke about he had depression whilst playing football as well. Um, you know, he, he wasn't feeling great when he was at Stoke and he, he felt like, you know, he was depressed at times. Do you feel like, uh, I'm, I'm from the outside, so I'm looking at you guys, you know, I'm a, I'm a football fan as well. You can see I've got Ronaldo and Cancer, I'm big fans. When I look at you guys, I think, you know, these are, or initially when I was younger, I'd look at and think, these are got everything sorted. They've got money, they play football, they've got an easy life. But really... When even when you're playing football, is is it is it like would you do, you talked about mental health there? Is this stuff going on in your mind where you know it does affect your mental health? Yeah, it, it does. It, and yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I went through stuff. I mean, it, I mean, you just touched on it there. Is that people just think that you know these footballers are they earn good money, they've got a nice lifestyle. It's and it's straightforward. It's not because you know you have to be careful what you do these days. You can't go places. You there's mobile phone people video and you, you know, you, you're actually in the public eye 24 seven, really, when you look at it, um, you know, and then you're on top of that, you're trying to, to train every single day to the best of your ability. You're preparing yourself for games. Um, and, and, and that's, that's, that's the problem. It's, it's not, you know, we all do different jobs and, and, and this is where, you know, I say footballers, they, they come under a lot of scrutiny because they earn so much money and, Yes, they earn so much money, but there's so much that comes with that. You know, there's the pressures. There's not being in the in the team uh, of a week, and it it doesn't fall down to to money at all. You know, that's just the added bonus that comes on top of the tree, really. But um, there's just so many pressures that come with 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 being a sports you know a sportsman. You, you know, it's like going out in front of 40, 40 50, 60, 000 players and trying to perform and and be your best. And and when that don't happen I mean I was a world's worst I used to come home if I'd had a bad game and I, I, I didn't want to speak to anyone I'd come in and I shut myself away and really and truly that it, sh it shouldn't be that way you know you should be coming back and certain players respond differently but you know you should be coming back and, and enjoying what you've done whether you've played good or bad but that's because you go onto social media you you read things people will put some stuff in the paper saying that I oh, had badly you've played and you know, it, it, there's a damage and effect that goes on in in in, in sport, and that's where I feel that it, it's a knock on as you gradually get towards the end of your career. All of them bad feelings mount into one, and it just explodes at times. And certain people can deal with it, and so certain people can't. 
you mentioned social media there. Do you think that the whole situation is getting worse? Because obviously social media is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, from compared to now and 10 years ago, it's, it's absolutely blown up social media. And obviously there, you know, there's problems with trolling, there's problems with racism on there. Do you think that it's only going to make things worse? And do you think that something needs to be done about that side of it? Yeah, I do. I, I do. I think social media can be it can be absolutely brutal at times. You know, you've touched on the the racism, the the personal issues that that people go through, and it, it it's just not right because that's a platform for for the general public, for sports fans to to relate and have that that understanding with with with, with sports uh, people, even you know, like I say, pop stars, movie stars, and all of them thing. But when it starts to get personal that's where I feel that something has to be stepped in and done, not just thrown off Twitter for a, a month or a week or whatever it is, or Instagram. It's it, it, something needs to be done internal where these people aren't being able to do that because it's easy to sit behind a computer and say all you want. I mean, I, I've had it since I've been doing the media stuff, which I didn't expect. So I would have, but you know, it, it's the same thing. It's a knock on effect. It's not just playing football. It's, it's being in the me- media, in the, the public eye where, you should be performing to your best. And if you don't, you make a mistake. You know, people jump on you quite quickly. And I, you know, I've I've tried to, I've actually thought about myself coming off social media because of that, that situation, because like when I was playing, you know, I take it personal, like everybody else would, you know, it's, it's not nice when you, you know, we don't, we don't go out and make mistakes on purpose. That that's, that's the thing. And, um, you know, that's where I feel that these, this trolling and uh, and all the abuse that, that goes online is just, it's so uncalled for when something needs to be stepped in and, and, and really someone needs to be made a, like a, an example of. You, you know, uh, when you look at social media, like me and Ali come from the boxing field as well. And Ali, yeah. you know how brutal it is with boxing fans to boxers and football fans to football players. But um, it's got to the stage where you actually, the rule is, just don't read comments. What? Why? Because yeah. no. there's bad ones. It's crazy. It's crazy. But the thing is, like, people will say, you know, sometimes we don't try to, we don't try to read any sort of social media stuff. But we're all human. So when when you yeah. get, a, a, you know, sort of a, a collective amount of people criticizing you, as a human being, it's very hard to just ignore that. It's, it does affect everyone. Like people might not want to talk about it, but does it? It does affect everyone. Yeah, it does. I, 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 like I say, when I finish games, I'm, I'm, I'm really apprehensive so if I feel I've had a, a good game commentating I'll, I'll come off and I'll think shall I have a look on social media well what's the point of me being on social media if I'm really hesitant about what comments are going to because let's face it if I've had a good game on uh, uh, comment on, on my commentating then it's not necessarily saying that I'm going to sue everyone that's that's watching and obviously there's fans that uh, have, have just lost the game and then all of a sudden then fans start getting on top of you and it's like well you know, it's where where do we turn with it? And and this is this is why I feel that it's a great platform for for celebrities to be on. But on the flip side of it, I think if you ask most, they don't want to read the the. You're there. You, it's there to be to give you a bit of a lift. But you know, most of the time, it's not. It's it's, it's a lot of negatives that, that comes across on social media. Lee, just before we talk about football, what, what sort of advice would you give to any upcoming football star at this present time, whether they're in a big club or not? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I always said this is that, you know, if I had my time again as a youngster, I'd, I'd certainly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a dedication game, which I, I always was coming through. I worked hard and, you know, I got my head down. I didn't have any distractions. It was just focus on football. But when I actually did get into the first team and I, you know, I got my first big contracts and, and, and all the rest of it, it was, that's where, your lifetime, your lifestyle changes, you know, you, you, your big money and stuff like that. And I, I sort of, as a youngster, I just wanted to play football. So I left all my finances involved with a financial advisor, my agent and stuff like that. I'd always say to youngsters is that, you know, you get there, right? You're the person that's actually got there and worked damn hard to get there. Um, that's where you need someone who you can trust to look after the background stuff of your finance, finances, um, you know, preparing yourself for future. I, I, you know, if I go back again, I'd, I'd have took my coaching badges while I was playing football. I would have prepared myself maybe for going into the media because there's such a big drop when you come out of football. So I'd always say to youngsters, is obviously your dedication is so important. 
obviously get someone looking after your personal affairs and prepare for your future. Good advice. Good advice. Right, let's talk football. So obviously we have to start with Aston Villa. And um, they're having a bit of a drop in form really at the, at the moment. They they started off quite well at the beginning of the season, but they're ninth in the table at the moment. Um, just talk to me about the sort of drop in form that they've been seeing recently. Obviously they're missing Jack Grealish, but just talk to me about that. Yeah, I, I, I've been, I mean, I've been impressed with, with how they've performed this season. I've, I think they've been... Uh, a breath of fresh air. I know it's, again, not having the fans there. Sometimes it helps. You know, Villa's a, a big club where there's so many expectations. I've, I've been on the back end of being on the pitch and being so close to them fans and you make mistakes and some, you know, players can go into a shell quite quickly, which I feel that's possibly helped this season, particularly with new players that they bought in. Um, obviously, the season that they almost went down um, last season. So I, I just felt that they've had time to settle. Dean's put his own philosophy on things and it's, it's starting to work. But I just feel the dip in form. I, I, can't, I can't get away from not having Jack Grealish in the team. It's as simple as that. I just feel that he's just, he's, he's a special player. Um, and without him in that team, I just feel that, it, I'm not saying it's a, a one-man team, but I think lots, uh, it's so evident that lots surround Jack of what he brings to the football team because he creates space for others. And he's just a he's just an exciting player going forward. He creates and scores goals. Um, even Matt, Matty Cash just coming back into the field. He was he's been a big player this season. Uh, so them two players. I know it's only two players, but it's amazing what effect one big player has on a whole squad of players. And it's just that you know that we've got a big player back, and everyone seems to uh, sort of bounce and 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 feed off what Jack does when he comes into the side. So I think I I feel that. Just of late, that's why the form's really dipped. Do you think that that Jack Grealish has sort of cemented his place in the England team now? Obviously, you know he's he's injured at the moment, but do you think that he it's justified that he should be in the England squad? Yeah, totally. I I, I said he. I think he's one. Of, I think he's one of the best players in the Premier League. Um, you know, he's. Uh, I know he, in today's world, stats stand out, and his stats, you know, they're, they're up there with the best. So that that just says it all. But I think cementing his England place. I think he'll still be he'll still be apprehensive whether he is or not because obviously how and uh, how he got into the squad and how you know all the the speculation that surrounded him and and obviously Gareth Southgate not picking him and then all of a sudden he came in and everyone says this is what this is why he should be playing um, but then you look at the big players that are also around I mean Phil Foden's one who stands out for me uh, Mason Mount you've got some very very good young players and. Unfortunately, it's one of them times where you can't fit all them players into into one side. So, I wouldn't say it's concrete cement for for Jack just yet, but I don't feel that he's he's a million miles off um, and being a regular in that team. But certainly, he'll be a regular in the squad. But he, I feel he's, he's he's a key standout player for me. To be honest, I think Jack Grealish playing on the left, cutting in, is probably the best in England. I don't think there's a better player doing because his decision making is just. He scores goals, but his assisting is amazing. But his decision making, only reason I say that is I'm a Man United fan and I see Rashford playing <laughs> on the left. And when yeah. I see Jack Grealish and I, I see Rashford, Rashford's a great finisher, great football player, but yeah. he, he lacks decision making. When I see Jack Grealish, he just knows what he's going to do and he's a step or two ahead of the of the defender. So that's that's my thought on it, to be honest. Yeah, I, 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 again, I think he's, he's he's one of them players that if Villa can keep hold of him, which that's my only. <laughs> My only doubt is that I don't think they'll keep hold of him this season. I think, it, well, at the end of the season, I think one of the top four will come in for him. I can't see how they won't. He's just, he's just such a good player. I mean, he, like you said, his decision making, you know, he, he's in the category of, of the top players at this moment in time. And he's in a team that, I'm not saying a, a mediocre, but they're not top four. So, you know, to keep hold of that prize asset, it's just, I think it's going to be so hard for Villa to do that. Where do you see him going if if he does he does leave Villa? <laughs> the good question because I actually had this conversation yesterday and um, I think you know you expect Jack to go to obviously Manchester United or Man City. I know there was he was heavily linked with with United. Um, again, you know, touching on players of, of how he can fit in, and this is this is the problem is. If he goes to City, is he going to be in an in and out player? We've seen how Mar uh, Mares was, and now all of a sudden he's in the squad. Foden's in and out of the team. Um, 
I mean, if I, I'm, I'm personal, I, I feel it, it, it suit going to uh, to Manchester United. If I'm being quite honest, and I think from knowing Jack, and I think that would probably suit him a, a little bit better. I really do, and I feel that Man United are certainly building and, and getting closer and closer these days. Uh, and with the squad of players they've got. Um, I just think he'd, he'd fit the bill. I think he'd play more than he would at, at, at City, if I'm quite honest. But again, they're going to have to pay over 100 million for him. So it's a, it's a, it's a big decision. And I, 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 like I said, if someone's going to fork out that kind of money, I feel that he's got to be playing week in, week out. And I feel that he'd have more chance at United. I think Villa staying up last season was the biggest catalyst to him. Because yeah. if they didn't, I think United would have bought him. United are one of the top yeah. four clubs would have bought him because he's too good a player to be dropping back into the Championship. And he's... He's potentially going to be one of the best English players for the next five to, five to seven years. So, yeah. Um, but talk to me about any other players that, you know, have excited you this season, Aston Miller. There's been quite a few good signings, obviously. The goalkeeper, Emi Martinez. Uh, you've got a good sort of centre-back pairing as well. Um, but there's been a few players. Who, who sort of stands up for you, apart from Grealish? Um, I mean, I, I, I was a fan that, uh, of Ollie Watkins, to be honest, when he, you know, I, I knew that they were certainly linked with him. Um I, it, only because I'd seen quite a lot of him at Brentford, um, and I, you know, I felt that they had a, a fabulous outfit there. They really did with uh, with Ben Rama as well on that left hand side, and, and Boemo. They had a great little bit of a blend in that front three, and obviously Oli moved into a, a more central a central forward role. Which um, when he went into that role, I actually thought I didn't know if he could fulfil that, um, and he did it brilliant. Obviously, scoring all his goals, which obviously got his move. Um, and since he's come in, you know, people have, have said, oh, I'm not too sure. And I've, I've said, listen, you've got to give him a chance. I've said the worst case for, for bringing Ollie Watkins in is that if it doesn't work out for him playing through the middle, he can play in wide areas. So you've got a bit of versatility in that player, which I, I felt was a, a, a good signing for Aston Villa. You've touched on Martinez, who's been brilliant. Um I think the, the, the concert stands out as well. He's been He's been really good in that. In that back four, I think, um, you know, there was lots of talk around Tyrone Mings, but I think you take Contra out of that equation and I feel that I feel that back four, you know, could be all over the place because he's been absolutely immense defensively. Um, and, 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 and I say, you know, Martinez has made some unbelievable saves this season, which I feel that's why Villa have been sort of steady away up to now. Um, I just feel that, again, we just need Jack, Jack back in the team. Actually, talking about concert, we've been talking to a lot of ex-footballers and every time I've asked them about defending, sort of defending has changed and there doesn't seem to be this elite sort of set of central defenders that we got back in the day. Back in the day, you could look back, it would be Rio Ferdinand, Vidic, yeah. John Terry, Cannavaro, you could pick them off, probably pick yeah. 10 world-class defenders off. You don't really see that as much no more. So when you look at people like concert, there's a few of the players around the Premier League who are doing well, Wesley Fofana, who just who uh, Leicester have signed has been fantastic. I feel like people like Quanta are going to get targeted in the summer or maybe maybe in January afterwards because there isn't that many good defenders out there at this present time. Uh, for yourself then, as much as Jack Grealish being um, the main guy to go, do you feel like there's going to be pressure to keep Quanta as well? Yeah, I do. I, I, I really do. I feel that... <laughs> I mean, listen, if, if Villa get into Europe this season, it's, it's, it's going to be a big ask, I must say. But, you know, they've still got a half a chance of, of maybe squeaking in there. But I think that'd be a, that's going to be a telling factor, I feel, this season because of how well they've done. If they can, if they can squeak in one of them um, European spots, it, that'll be a difference. Um, but, you know, when, when players like Concer are, are stepping up to the Premier League and, and fulfilling that and... and and performing week in, week out. Yes, there's going to be speculation that then players are going to go because let's you've just touched on there. There's not many great centre halves out there at the moment that can do defend and play football. Um, you know, you have to look as far deep as you know Van Dijk, who's obviously injured, but you do feel that maybe a bigger club will certainly come in for for them sort of players. And this is going to be the big question for for Villa: Can they? afford to keep these players, which I know that they've got the, the, the funds to do that. But I think if they start selling their players, it just devalues what, what they've achieved so far. And I feel at this moment in time, if they can keep Grealish, they can keep the concerts, Martinez, I feel that Villa can go and push on again next season if they bring a two or three three players in. So it's all about 
obviously decisions and, and where they finish this season. You touched on it then. Um, what is a realistic goal now for Aston Villa? You said potentially there's a chance of European football. Do you think that's a realistic goal that they are still aiming for? Um, I've, got, I've, I've got to say, I, I actually don't think they will uh, qualify for Europe, if I'm being honest. I feel that... Um, I'm not saying it's out of their depth at all because, you know, they, they've got games in hand. Um, but like you say, off the back of the form recently, it just feels like they've they've sort of run out of steam a little bit for me, um, which a mid-table finish would be an absolute fantastic, you know, finish to the season. I think, I think when you look at what Sheffield United did last season and, and, and reflection to this season, I feel that it's just, it's, it's small steps for, for Villa at the moment. And I feel that, Listen, if they got into Europe, they'd, I mean, it'd be an absolute, well, Dean Smith would be a, an instant legend at the club, wouldn't he? So, but I do feel at this moment in time, I feel, you know, top top half would be it'd be a fabulous season for Villa. And he's just moving away from Villa. Um, I can always remember yourself being sort of a player that used to, when you scored goals, they'd always be... <laughs> They'd always be classic goals, like great goals, a little flick or, you know, taking on two, three players, slotting it in. We probably saw one of the best goals in the Premier League this weekend from Eric Lamella uh, with the Rabona through the legs of uh, Thomas Partey curling into that corner. For me, when I saw it, I watched it. I, I don't know how many times I watched it already. Before you, Lee, what did you make of that? Because that was absolutely out of the world. Well, uh, it, it was funny because I did the Spurs game uh, the week before where Harry Kane bent that one in the top corner and I was like, that is just top draw for me. But to see the Rabona was just, I mean, my lads, we sat and watched it here and they, we had to get, we were similar to you, we kept rewinding it and saying, did he actually attempt that? But I mean, that is just top draw, isn't it? You, I mean, to even have the audacity to even try that in such a big game, and to finish it off the way he did, well, I mean, you've, you can only take your hats off, can't you, and say what a fabulous finish. I mean, it's just the cheek of it. But, you know, I think this is what we're seeing. We're seeing more flair uh, players coming into the Premier League um, just of late. And I think now we're seeing, you know, he's starting to come to the forefront of, of what we've actually got in this league. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see some of the, the goals that we've seen this season. Do you think that that goal would have been attempted had there been fans in the stadium? Or do you think that there's more sort of flair going on because there's there's not the backlash of the fans if it goes wrong? Yeah, no, you're right. You, you're right. I, I I totally agree because I think I only I seen I think the only person I ever seen do that was David Dunn, and uh, he fell over actually. It was in the, he was trying to make a pass. He was in the middle of the field, and that was in. And, and to be fair, he got slated for it obviously because he, he he tried to attempt it, but he actually fell over, which made it even worse. But to actually take a shot on like that way I feel that this is when I think at the moment the games are similar to, to sort of being in a training ground environment which we probably do that in a training session um, and it was funny because I was speaking to someone who, who knows James Milne and he says some of the players of this season and since we've been in lockdown and there's not been fans the players who are really good in training have been good this season particularly because they haven't had the pressure of the fans and, and, and they've been able to do certain things that they possibly wouldn't do. So it's a good point. I, th I, don't, think, I don't think you would have tried that. I really don't. Not in a game of that stature. I just feel that when there's fans around, it's, it's a little bit different. It is. You know, we spoke to um, one of the guys who works for Sky Sports um, about sort of the best footballers and he's, he, gave, he gave us a couple of footballers and he spoke about Ronaldinho. And when I look at flair players nowadays, I always feel like Ronaldinho is probably one of the catalysts uh, at that point because three, four years that he was playing absolutely amazing football. There was just such a big wow factor to him that I felt like there was there's a big circle afterwards that came out, just wanted to do emulate things that he's doing. So I feel like there's been a lot of things post Ronaldinho that you know, now you see a lot of these things that people are trying. I think they were because of like sort of the post Ronaldinho era. Personally, you, do you feel like Ronaldinho had that sort of effect on world football? Yeah, I do. But you, again, you've got to back it up, haven't you? I mean, we're talking about Ronaldinho. He was literally the best. I mean, one of the best players in the world, if uh, if not. And and some of the things he did try on a football pitch were, well. He was he was a master at it, wasn't he? You know some of the things you see. I mean, you're you're dead right. I think lots of people have looked and gone back. Even my lads actually, you know, they they watch 
the old sort of players and, and they took touched on, on Ronaldinho and, and what skills he does. And my boys always say to me, oh, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? And I'm like, no, just listen, run around, keep the ball and just keep it simple. <laughs> um, he's special. Some of these players, you know, are, are very special and you've got to have a gift, I feel, to, to be able to do that. But we are seeing quite a lot of sort of trickery sort of football these days. And, and, and you're right, I think people are looking to them situations and then players and going, you know what, why can't I try and be that sort of player? I think there's more flair in, in, in our game now rather than the nitty gritty. I mean, back in my day, if someone would have tried something like that, it'd, it'd have ended up getting booted into the stands or you know, you know what it's like. So it's the, the game's changed an awful lot, really. That The tackling's not as, as intense. Um, so that gives you a lot more time to on the ball to do them sort of tricks. And I say to, I say to myself now, I'd love to play in this current sort of era just because of having not not as much more time but I was always fit and I'd run around but I just feel I'd be a lot a, a better player playing in this in this sort of standard of football because I was I like to play football I like to do the little spins around the corner and go and join in where it was hard to do that in back in our day because you'd get absolutely booted all around the place no, it's a good point actually you were, you were very tidy on the ball you, you had that little Bit of flick down, a couple of goals I remember from yourself. They were great, great <laughs> flicks into the net and stuff. So definitely agree with that. I want to ask you though, Lee, your best. You who do you think is the best footballer in world football at this present time? Oh, very good question. Um, I mean, I've, I've got. I think Mbappe is unbelievable. To be honest, I just feel he's just a, a young man with bags and bags of talent. Um, I just feel that he, well. For me, I, I, I put, I, I, I mean, I'm a big Messi fan. I've always, always thought he's been the best player in the world for, for quite some time. You know, it's always been a battle with him and Ronaldo, but, you know, Mbappe's just, he's something special. He's, he's pacey, he's, he's got great feet, he can score goals. Um, I still feel there's a lot more to come from him. Um, and I'd love to see him in the Premier League, but I feel at this moment in time, he, he's got to be up there. He's got to be up there in, in, in world class players. Well, one question that we always ask our former players is, who do you think is the greatest player that you ever played alongside? Oh, um, I, I loved playing with um, Dwight York. Um, I just, uh, he was, I can't, as a midfielder, he was just such a, a great player to play with because he, like, like I just touched on, I like to have balls into my feet and I try and be quite sharp and get away from my midfielder, whereas... I'd always play into a front man and, and Yorkie. If I played a ball in, I wouldn't really have to look because I'd sort of be on that sort of what same wavelength and it'd just be spin. Even if it was a bad ball, he'd make it a good ball because he was so strong and then he'd give it you back. The great little interchange and play he was. And then I seen him score some unbelievable goals. And I remember being on the training ground quite a lot with him and he teaches how to watch goalkeepers, how to take penalties. And he was, he was just... Honestly, he's one of the best players I've, I've ever ever played with. He was he was immense just to to have as a front man from a mid midfielder's perspective. He was absolutely brilliant. Did, did you always think he was going to do what he did at Man United? Yeah, I did. I, honestly, I, I remember as a kid he came in. Ron Atkinson had him. Um, he brought him in, and this was one of his first days. And there was they call I think they called him the Calypso kid. He was honestly. And I didn't know an awful lot about him. Um, and Big Ron got all of us in, in the big main changing room. And he had Yorkie. He had him stood in like a, a, a dustbin. And he threw the ball at him. And he he just he was just keeping the ball up on his head. And he was rolling it down. He was kissing it. It was, it was, it was literally. And I thought, I can't wait to see this guy play. I really can't. If he can do that standing in the dustbin, I can't wait till he's out on a, on a football pitch. And, well... He just he, he he was brilliant from day dot. Uh, Ron loved him. Literally, he had him. He was like his his golden child. He was and and, and York, he was he was always have a smile on his face. He always had time for you to have a chat with you. And like I said, he he almost took me under his wing because I was a young lad coming into the side. And he was uh, obviously when he went to Manchester United, I, I knew that that was going to happen. It was just a matter of time because of the goals he'd scored and and. Such a flair player, he just suited the suited a Manchester United shirt. Absolutely, Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great talking to you, and hopefully we'll get you back on again soon once uh, 
once we know what is happening with uh, that yeah. <laughs> hopefully thank, thank you, you very much, mate. thank you very much Great to be joined there by Lee Hendry. But guys, stay tuned. We have lots more coming up on the show. Loads of guests that are planned to come on. So stay tuned. But please continue to support the channel. Do what you can. Subscribe, like, share, comment. Whatever you can, we do really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.